Good day, everyone. I am Dr. Lucy from Nova, Innovation Policy and Training Officer for the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Bermuda. I hope you enjoyed your lunch and got to mingle and relax a little bit. Uh, also, just a minor note, we will make sure that the subtitles to this video will be uploaded on the YouTube channel uh, after um, this panel and the conference. Up next is uh, data transfer mechanism. Uh, mechanisms. The panel will be moderated by Ms. Boyana Bellamy. The panel aims to capture various developments regarding international data transfer law, policy and practice, and to discuss the shared path forward. Without further ado, Ms. Bellamy, please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm just going to stand up as I introduce this panel, and then I will sit back. I just feel a little bit more connected with the room. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming for what is always the most difficult session um, after lunch. Um, the sun is out, and we are in Bermuda. I mean, there's so much other lovely things to do uh, than perhaps talk and listen about data flows. Uh, but I'm really glad you are here. We do have the longest uh, panel in the history of GPA, <laughs> and we are absolutely delighted to have that record. Yesterday was the record for the shortest answer. If you remember, Uli Kelber said yes. <laughs> so today, somebody just has to say, hmm, okay? <laughs> That's what we need to do, but we will get there on time. Um, we do have an amazing group of um, panelists today, and it shows you that everybody wanted to be here. Everybody wanted to have their point of view um, I add out there, and of course we've got a very diverse panel, which is really important for the topic that we are going to talk about today. Um, but let me first of all say great thanks. Um, they're not customary, they come from the heart to Alexander White and his amazing team, but also INAI and the executive committee for putting this conference together, for hosting us in an amazing Bermuda. I think this, this topic is particularly well suited for your amazing country that actually thrives on flows of people, flows of goods, flows of data, flows of ideas, in is in between the world, in the middle of the ocean. And if you, would, if you don't have data, you wouldn't probably have anything anymore. So I completely understand that. So thank you very much. It's been inspirational to be here. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the Global Privacy Assembly for actually listening to experts, people who are not privacy uh, regulators, and supervisory authorities, but are experts in the field. I sit on the global reference panel. That was also mentioned yesterday. We really appreciate the outreach, the exchanges, the constructive engagement um, with all of us. We are here to help you, to serve you as well. So thank you again for allowing us into your world. Our worlds are actually together, right? There are no two worlds. We are in this, in this uh, really together. Now, you are asking yourself, why are we talking about data flows, right? And why, again, don't we know everything that is to be known about this topic? And I would say, yes, we do. Yes, you do. Um, and therefore, we are not going to do the basics. We are not going to be do ABC of what adequacy is, BCR, uh, contracts. Actually, it is ABC, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it was not intended. It just occurred to me now. Um, so what we would like to do on this panel is actually to take us forward, right? Um, there, has been, there have been developments. We have got some tools. How do we take this forward? What concretely can we do? What concretely can each of these panelists who have got important roles to play do to take us forward? And what can you, as Global Privacy Assembly, do um, to take us forward to solve this once and for all? And, and why are we talking about this now? Um, uh, forgive me, but I need to remind us. Uh, we are at the inflection point. Um, we understand absolutely the developments and the importance in terms of both the data flows and what has happened in the past few years in terms of policy, law, and compliance. Um, legal, on the one hand, legal restrictions on data flows exist everywhere. Um, IPP has counted, I don't know, 100 plus countries have got these kind of rules. We've got 20 kinds of um, standard contractual clauses, and it has been complicated by um, mixing the government access to data with commercial data flows. And all of a sudden, we found into ourselves, ourselves in a, in, a, in a sort of between the rock and the hard place, where these restrictions have been much more complex and difficult to comply with because of the government access um, uh, aspect. Secondly, we've got the rise of localization 
requirements. Some are explicit, requiring data to stay in the country. Uh, some of uh, our scholars here, Alex Joel, has been working on this, right? But some are implicit. Some are de facto localization requirements because the marketplace is responding to difficulties, illegal restrictions, but saying, do you know what? I cannot be bothered, we'll keep data here. And that's not good for anybody. And I'll tell you why. Um, and then we have got something which um, uh, uh, somebody else has actually calls, uh, called the legal arms race for data. Um, there's a great article by Bertrand de la Chapelle uh, and uh, Paul um, Fellinger in 2016. Uh, it was a commission for international, data gov international governance innovation at Chatham House. And what they talk about there is that um, it's a principle of reciprocal diplomacy, which is very well known in diplomacy. And when one country does something, other countries follow. And so what they're kind of saying is that what we're seeing now in the internet governance is this very dangerous space where the lack of coordinated uh, and cooperation action leads to actors, so countries, um, uh, putting in place unilateral tools, making short-term decisions which look like they make sense for themselves short-term, but in fact, in, in this immediate interest, long-term, through its cumulative effect, is suboptimal and detrimental to them in the long-term. And what they say is that the sum of these uncoordinated and unilateral actions by governments and private actors can have unintended consequences. And I actually thought to myself, this is exactly the space we are in data flows. A set of unilateral act actions that we think are, are beneficial for us short term are actually making it suboptimal and uh, unintended consequences are damaging to all of us long term. And we cannot have that. That doesn't work. And of course, add to that data sovereignty and geopolitical uh, 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 aspect of data flow. So that's really what has happened in one side on the inflection point. On the other side on the inflection point, I don't need to tell you that, yes? Data flows is absolutely essential. It's essential for our human progress. It's essential for our economic progress. It's essential for us, what we are as humans, as a society. COVID has showed us that. AI is showing us that we need data in order to have just and unbiased AI. We need data in order to ensure the south and east of this globe also has got access to data and democracy and education and everything else. So we need to ensure data flows, yet we keep restricting. And as Marcus Heider, our vice president, um, has recently quoted Galileo, yet it moves. Despite whatever we do, data is moving, will always be, um, be moving. And I'm delighted to also say that we at CIPL have actually published together with Alex Joe at the TLS uh, University of Washington a set of two papers where we actually talked about the real harms of that kind of unilateral decisions of data localization. What are the real harms that <coughs> happen in four categories, right, to people, society, and companies, and public sector from these data localization policies? So there is no doubt that data needs to flow, and it will flow, as Galileo has written on his prison cell when he talked about the Earth um, uh, going around the sun, right? Despite the church heresy, honestly, data will flow. Um, and so, where are we now? The, the, third the third aspect of infliction point is the fact that the momentum has built. You know, sometimes you need a crisis to actually start realizing where you are. And I think we have had a bit of that crisis with a number of events. And the momentum is positive. And we will talk about this positive momentum. My panelists here will give me their aspect of what they see to be positive, but we have got G20, G7, data free flows with trust. We have had US, EU data protection framework agreed. We've got OECD agreed, government principles, uh, trusted government access principles. Did we ever think this would have been agreed between 37 states? Well, no. We have interesting developments in global CBPR forum becoming global and being potentially a way forward with some need for upgrades. We've got SECs being contracts being mapped across the board to ensure this multilateralism. Uh, we've got some, U some laws like UK Data Protection Bill having a slightly different approach, taking GDPR to 2.0 data flow uh, situation, which I like. I think that's really good for everybody. And then we had lots of influential papers. OECD published a really important paper in, 20 in April this year. 
German Marshall Fund did the same. UK government is going to publish a paper by the expert um, uh, board uh, on data flows, expert committee, and I know a number of people here sit on that committee. So I think there is a momentum, and what I'd like to do is we want to now discuss how do we capture and how do we capitalize on this momentum? What can we all do to take this forward to help those companies, SMEs, government, lawyers, everybody who wants to participate in data economy but finds these spag legal spaghetti of mechanisms complicated, distracting them from doing real privacy work, they say. This is my provocation to you today. I would like our privacy officers to do privacy by design, ethical development of AI, responsible deployment of AI tools, um, training, awareness. I would like them to do that rather than papering, papering data flows just because we decide again and again that some of our legal mechanisms don't quite work. So this is the challenge to this panel. I would like all of us to be pragmatic, solution-oriented, very short uh, in answers, because we have lots of people, and there is tea after this as well, and I'm <laughs> sure another lightning talk, um, in, in, in addressing with me um, constructively how we take this forward. Um, and to start with um, uh, our panel, let me introduce, first of all, Elizabeth Denham, uh, who is Chief Policy Strategist at the International Information Accountability Foundation, but also is um, advisor to Baker McKenzie Law Firm, and everybody knows her from her previous roles at the UK Information Commissioner, as well as British Columbia. And Elizabeth, I would like, Liz, I would like to ask you to kick us off and answer the question which I'd like to ask everybody, and that is, what makes you optimistic that we can build on this momentum? Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Thanks for the hosting, Alex and team, and the GPA. Really happy to be up here with this mega panel, um, and thanks for kicking this off. Boyana has actually stolen all of the no, guts of, of my first answer, but <laughs> what, I, what I'll tell you is, you know... Repetitio mater studior rest, which is repeat, repeat. So, <laughs> you know, we've been talking about data flows for 20 years. I'm looking at Marty, it's maybe longer than that. And I have been in the valley of despair, and I have been optimistic at times, but how do I feel now? I, I actually do feel there are some beacons of light, and the beacons of light for me are, it's a coalescence of a lot of initiatives and a lot of developments that take us here at the inflection point that Boyan is talking about, and I really think that is, it's the new framework, it's the new data privacy framework, which I think is stronger and more ro robust and actually takes two legal systems and finds that in, the, in terms of outcomes, they are essentially the same. So I think that's really positive. The other thing that's positive is in 2021, the Global Privacy Assembly issued a resolution that was signed on by 128 data protection authorities about government access to private sector data. So huge check mark. And on the heels of that work of the GPA came the OECD declaration on government access to private sector data, which chimed those two initiatives, those two, the words, the resolutions, the declarations were very similar. Um, G7 work on um, data flows with trust, some of the G20 work. I think these are really, really important. And so it really is a coalescence of a lot of voices and a lot of initiatives at the same time. And if we can't do it now, when can we do it? So beacons of light, still a long way off for any kind of multilateral or international instrument. So. Short-term, medium-term, I see some positives, mm -hmm. but long-term, I'll leave it to my colleagues. Liz, let me, let me follow up with, with another question to you in particular, which is, you see this now from the other side. I mean, you were a regulator, now you are advisor to businesses and you work with businesses. What's the message you are getting from business? I mean, do they, are they optimistic about this or are they a little bit growing their gray hair? Yeah, there's a lot of gray hair. Um, <laughs> I think, so when I'm advising law firm clients, the second most um, popular question, the second question that I'm asked most about is data flows. The first concern of law firm clients right now is much, is, is really a lot about AI, responsible AI, 
ethical deployment of technology. But the second most popular topic is data flows. I think that um, the big question I'm getting from clients is, should we stick with SCCs? Because most companies have actually taken up SCCs after the second invalidation of the agreement. So SCCs are everywhere. And in fact, SC SCCs have gone global. So I'm seeing global companies actually doing intra-company agreements. So in a way, companies have taken SCCs and gone global. So a decision is a big one for a company to then switch to the data privacy framework. Personally, and thinking back on my career as a regulator, it, I think the the DPF actually encourages and initiates a, an accountability approach, a whole global systems approach to privacy and data protection. The SCCs feels like a paper tiger, but you know, obviously the court has added to the requirements under SCEs for data impact assessment, transfer mm -hmm. impact assessments. But you know, at the end of the day, I think what companies have to do is going to be dependent on their appetite for risk, is going to be dependent on their processing, what kind of data they're transferring around the world, and whether or not really they're looking for a more public statement about the effectiveness and the comprehensiveness of their, of their program. Thank you. Uh, well, why don't I go now to somebody who actually is a current regulator, um, and that's actually Bertrand Dumaret, who is a, the latest addition to our panel, but we are delighted to have uh, the voice of European regulators who have also been thrown a little bit into the difficult waters because you have to also understand what is the level of protection in these other third countries, as well as the companies who are doing the transfer risk assessment. But Bertrand, you were at the G7 meeting as well, of data protection authorities, and of course, CNIL is one of the leading DPAs when it comes to has been always when it comes to data flows, but what makes you optimistic? Well, thank you very much, uh, first of all, uh, Boyana, to um, um, have organized this, uh, this panel and to invite me, to have invited me. Um, you know, yeah, yes, I feel uh, fairly optimistic uh, for, for, for several reasons. Um, you know, um, transfer flow, uh, da data transfer uh, flows is not only about, uh, you know, economics on business, uh, business plan. It's also about sharing the same values and mutual understanding. And mutual understanding is a matter of uh, a dialogue between uh, several jurisdictions. It's also um, a matter of uh, uh, to really uh, understand what are the values that are commonly shared? And in this respect, I feel fairly optimistic because as Liz just said, there is a multiplication of fora where these discussions take place. Maybe from, um, you know, um, from an operational point of view, you may think, well, you know, this fora, they are discussing blah, blah, blah. But actually, uh, most of these fora and almost all of these fora are focusing on one of the uh, one of the um, um, transferred instruments which are uh, you know, listed in the JDPR. So you have a division of labor, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, you know, the, we, we know that the GPA is um, in actively uh, working on uh, model contractual clauses. The Council of Europe do, uh, so, do also the same. Um, in terms of certification schemes, um, we, the EDPB issued some guidelines. Uh, the global CBPR is working on it. And uh, the J7 DPA um, roundtable um, initiated um, a, a work on, on, on certification schemes. And um, as to the BCR, there is this, um, or let me remind you that the uh, working group, uh, the G, G7, G29 sorry, working group, uh, has done some work uh, um, well, some time ago, but it's still relevant. So there is a division of labor. Uh, another thing which, and, and, and uh, going into uh, practical um, deliverable. Mm -hmm. And these deliverable are most of the time sort of mapping of the different instruments that are used in different jurisdictions so that 
and that's my second point. Mm -hmm. uh, legislators at the national, maybe at the international level, or regional level, I would say, are able to see where are the discrepancy, but also where are the common commonalities. And in this, and, and, and the second aspect that actually, uh, you know, legislators are, are, are more and more concerned about convergence between the different uh, approach, uh, different approaches. Um, you can see that, and this makes me fairly optimistic, you can see that in specific topics, such as, you know, protection of child, AI. So you, there is a real pressure on us regulators um, from the policymakers, from the legislators, to uh, you know, to, to 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 have some improvement into um, into these specific issues, which I think will lead to a, a more convergence, um, a better convergence in terms of principles. So once again, I'm you know, I am. Um, the, 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 the funny thing with the CNIL is we are not full-time commissioners, so I'm a judge, so I sit in panels. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that having sound and well-drafted principles are usually more efficient than very detailed uh, bylaws or, or soft law or, or, or regulation. So the real issue is to have a convergence on principles. And when the principles are sound, then at the enforcement, implementation and enforcement uh, stages, uh, things are much easier and legal certainty is much stronger. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and actually, I like that distinction. So we are looking for convergence of tools, which certainly is happening, but actually we really need to look for convergence of principles and underlying um, requirements because and I think we probably are much more near than we think and but there is devil in the detail may I ask um, Nima Singh Giuliani now to comment from the US perspective because you were championing global CBPR uh, for some time um, and is that the way to converge the principles is that what makes you optimistic or are there some other things as well Sure. Um, first thank you so much I'm, I'm very excited to, to be joining this panel and talking about this issue um, maybe I'll take a, a step back and talk about the optimism and then what I think is next, including with global CBPR. Um, I think as others have said on the panel, what is making me optimistic going forward is the evidence that we all can work together, um, have different legal regimes, the common principles, and build frameworks that work. Um, and that's really the data privacy framework. Um, it was much dialogue, it was much collaboration. And I think we've arrived in a moment where there's momentum. But I think a, a critical and key important part of the conversation, Brianna, this is something you and I were discussing last night, is not to necessarily get stuck in the technicalities, but think about the practicalities. And so with the data privacy framework, one of the things that's been central has been, how are we gonna work with companies? This isn't about having a few technical solutions, it's about a solution that works for small and medium-sized businesses, a business in North Carolina or Alabama who may want to spread globally and needs an efficient way to transfer data. So one of the things that makes me optimistic is that with the data privacy framework, and I think within all of these conversations, um, we're really centering on how do we build frameworks that work and how do we build frameworks that should work for businesses of all sizes I think reflecting broader goals of economic inclusivity and economic equity. Um, so I guess that's one piece. Mm -hmm. You know, looking forward, what's the solution? You know, you mentioned the global CBPR system. You know, one of the, the pieces of progress this year, another reason to be optimistic, is the announcement earlier this year of launching the CBPR forum that began in APAC, launching that globally. And that was, again, reflective of this broader sense that we can have different legal regimes, but with common principles, we can facilitate the data transfers, not to have the technical solution, but I think very much in recognition of the concerns we hear from a broad spectrum of stakeholders about the challenges with data flows, and how can we build something that is interoperable? How can we build something that is streamlined? How can we build something that is practical in today's world that actually meets the needs of people? 
I, I like the focus on people because I think this is what this is all about ultimately. It's not about a PhD thesis or doing a theoretical uh, paper, but it's actually about how do we protect people and when data is flowing, what kind of harm may, may they be and what kind of protections we need for that for that data to flow. And I'd like to actually now ask the European Commission, you can see this is not Bruno Giancarelli. <laughs> I mean, he does say a big hello to everybody, but he has been detained on really important, actually, uh, business that is beyond data flows. It, it's Middle East and, 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 and the crisis there. Um, but Dolores Dozo is um, um, uh, going to take his place, and she is a senior key expert for Latin America at the EU Data Flow Project. Now, can we hear uh, from the European Commission's perspective, uh, Dolores, what, what makes you feel optimistic, and how do we build this convergence of principles I mean, can that be something which isn't just GDPR? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, let me give you two reasons why I think that I'm optimistic compared to years ago. Uh, first, as many of you already said, the conversation has now um, grown into a more global, more diverse, uh, more, more in increasingly uh, involving new actors, both from the private and the private sector. And as many of you already mentioned, the G7, uh, the G20, and already the role of um, data protection authorities and their networks are, are having a more and more increasing and important role. So um, a few years ago, I think that um, this would have been essentially a transatlantic conversation in the sense of EU, US, um, but now we have a range of actors, but also more geographic representation. So now that we are all on the table, we can discuss uh, with a global approach, let's say. So um, um, that's, uh, well, that's the first thing that I would say on reasons to be optimistic. And then send the, the two uh, the second uh, would be that, of course, that privacy frameworks around the world doesn't have to be identical. No one, no one wants to, that to happen. Um, but it's for sure that today there's a better understanding on what are those key commonalities, those key elements that mm -hmm. we all need to be looking for when regulating and when enforcing privacy. Um, so that's my second reason to be optimistic. And I think that this, this better understanding has allowed, in many cases, to build bridges uh, across regions, between regions, not only uh, within regions, but between regions. And I think that that's the path that we are now uh, entering to, passing through uh, a th a th the, from the theory of convergence to the practice of convergence. So I think that, uh, and what I mean by practice of convergence, I will give you two examples. Um, first is the, all the work that several regions are undergoing and, and, and doing to somehow recognize equally or as equal data transfer mechanisms. Mm -hmm. In particular, SECs, contractual model clauses, are uh, a very effective tool in and for instance, uh, Asian and European Union, several, we, there are several regions or, and jurisdictions that has this type of instruments. And that's a concrete improvement in practice that, that could lead us to global convergence, uh, recognize as neutral and, and work on that, how to build that bridge between uh, model clauses. And the second example is um, mutual adequacy arrangements, not unilateral decision adequacy decisions, but mutual adequacy decisions um, that that could lead into a comprehensive area of data flows and secure data flows amongst two two different regions or well countries, um, such as the the current negotiations the European Commission is having with Brazil. So, I'll, so I'm, I'm, see, I'm hearing quite a lot of convergence here in the sense that you all talk about we are not looking for identical uh, rules. We are looking for um, sort of outcomes-based rules almost. 
uh, the key elements have to be there. And I, I, I remind everybody um, the excellent panel that we've had from Caribbean region where the Caribbean privacy commissioners and practitioners have said to us, you know, we cannot just import another law and patch it on top of what we do. We have to make it adaptable and appropriate for our country as well, for the kind of economy we want to be. And I think that really is important. I mean, that's, that's, some, that's already something. It's, 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 a, it's a step forward, I think, that uh, realization. I'm going to now move on to Commissioner um, Yuji Asai from Privacy um, uh, Personal Information Protection Commission in Japan. Of course, it was Japan, uh, Japan's leadership and the late... Um, uh, Premier um, uh, Shinzo Abe, who has set this visionary concept of the free data flows with trust. Um, and I know the Privacy Commission in Japan has done huge amounts of work to promote that globally. So we all now use DFFT acronyms, and we know what it means. So tell us a little bit about what are you working on at the moment, and what, what makes you optimistic, particularly from the G7 discussions that you've had in Japan recently? First, uh, great pleasure for me to be here with all uh, great experts. Uh, this is honorable for me. So I want to start to say um, optimistic situation is already recent legal uh, development on the personal data transfer. Uh, globally, more than 160 jurisdictions have introduced comprehensive laws. I think level of data protection in the world becomes rising and converging. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, we see more uh, many uh, problems. Uh, we may need a uh, critical solution, but I would say we see Optical, uh, optimistic situation around us. And uh, important is to operationalize DFFT. Um, key is to implement uh, technical approaches. In my view, there are the three key mechanisms already uh, we, uh, we have. That is adequacy and uh, certification and the model contractual clauses. But these three keys um, in different aspects, but uh, going to global uh, approaches, not to stick into one country and two countries, three countries and the regions. Um, this is most uh, important to see there is a momentum toward uh, three, with three approaches to global uh, scale. So um, such growing momentum for development of data transfer mechanisms on global scale to operationalize of DFFT going on already. So that's why I would say, again, I am positive about operationalization of DFFT. Excellent, and we would like to see more of that as well. Yeah. And thank you for all your leadership in that as well. Um, you know, sometimes you need people and, and organizations to actually push concepts and do the work, and I think that's exactly what everybody here is trying to do. Uh, let me now move on to um, our two commissioners from Latin America and, of course, Kenya. Um, and I, maybe I will go to the uh, Immaculate Kasai, Data Protection Commissioner of Kenya, to ask you um, what makes you optimistic in how data flows are, uh, have evolved but also tell us a little bit what's on the mind of data protection authorities of Africa when it, when it comes to data flows. Uh, thank you, Bojan, and my fellow panelists for this opportunity to sit here in the panel to contribute to this uh, very current issue on data flows. Um, I think one of the issues that perhaps we have not talked about is um, technical, no, that would make us optimistic is the technical and organization measures, mm -hmm. such as uh, data 
spaces. We are seeing increasingly, we find um, app space bringing together data providers, users, and intermediaries. And they are all adapting uh, mechanisms that actually then help in terms of data flows. Um, I think that's, that's a reason to be optimistic. Outside the intergovernmental and international conversations, that is something already happening in companies. Uh, specifically for just thinking through in terms of Africa, of course I have to say, perhaps the conversation around data, pro uh, data flows in Africa has not been as robust as has been in the rest of Africa, of the world. We are happy to be in these spaces. Um, first as the first vice president on the national, of the Network for African Data Protection Authority. We are seeing increasingly African countries come up with data protection regulatory framework. That in itself is a statement of seeing how then African countries align when it comes to data protection. Um, uh, two, we are seeing uh, regional integration in the forms of the African Union uh, coming up with uh, harmonizing digital policies and fostering regional integration. Just last year, the African Union came up with a framework on data protection. So that's a reason to be optimistic. Three, we see regional economic blocks in Africa, whether it's East Africa, ECOWAS, or SADAC, the promoting intergovernmental data flows. Uh, and they are all aimed at uh, making sure there is uh, harmony in terms of the, the digital economy within their specific region, because clearly there's a lot of trade happening within those regions. Uh, we've also seen, we also increasingly see uh, an increase in terms of uh, cross-border data transfer agreement, uh, including bilateral agreements. Some African countries, of course, um, enter into mutual agreements within themselves and uh, the other one is multinational agreement, uh, whether it is with the WTO or the African uh, Free Trade Agreement. Um, something which uh, increasingly attempts can be controversial, but also happening within the African continent is data localization and data centers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are seeing countries encouraging people to have, uh, to establish local data centers uh, as we do to keep them within the national boundaries. And of course, the, um, there is always a concern about national sovereignty when it comes to issues around data uh, localization. Regulating of data localization is another issue that uh, we see there is an increase in terms of storing sensitive uh, personal data within countries. Uh, international um, data transfer, we've seen um, contractual, which has been spoken about contractual uh, clauses and also binding corporate rules. Um, increasingly, we've seen a lot of um, collaboration, capacity building within the African continent. And uh, I think uh, realizing that um, it's not a choice when it comes to matters of data flows, it's a matter of course, because the only way to improve trade is uh, to allow for free flow of, uh, of data among East African countries. So there is reason to optimistic. People are increasingly seeing the reason why you must then allow that flow, and that's why you're seeing uh, an increase in terms of the framework, uh, collaboration between different companies to see that uh, issues around data flows uh, become an issue, of course. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Immaculate. I think this is it's really interesting what you said at the beginning. I, I think that is important, which is the accountability and the organizational and technical measures that those who are transferring data putting in place is are really going to be hugely important and I know many people are working on privacy enhancing technology privacy preserving technologies encryption and these have got a role to play as well as as kind of access controls and and other contractual measures that companies put I, I kind of wonder whether we have forgotten a little bit about accountability as a transfer principle and we can re, re, um, re, uh, reconsider this um, I do have a, a follow-up question which I need to ask which is why do you think that African countries, some African countries are also putting data localization on, on the agenda when you say this is not a choice? We know that this is a matter of trade, it's a matter of progress, but yet we want to localize data. So isn't that a contradiction? <laughs> I mean, why, why, why do you think they're doing Nobody knows. We all can all guess, but what do you think? I, I think many times um, it's always the question about balancing uh, data sovereignty that uh, some of this information is extremely uh, important to the country. 
and uh, having uh, information hosted outside the country, yeah. uh, then what does that mean for a particular country in terms of uh, data that has something to do with their citizen? And th I think this is an interesting thing we have to consider, which I think, uh, Alex, you have reflected in your paper and I'm hearing, which is sometimes countries do have a, a, a justifiable reason to restrict data flows so to be consider considerate about where data is flowing. We will talk about government access to data, but I do want to come to, to um, uh, Beatrice de Anchorena, the, who is the director of the Data Privacy Authority in Argentina. Um, um, and. and Beatrice, what, what makes you feel optimistic and how does the, the, the amended um, Argentinian law uh, look at, the, at, the, at this variation of different uh, transfer mechanisms? Well, good, good evening to everybody. I bring the, the opinion of the South of Latin America <laughs> and I, I really feel optimistic. I want to feel optimistic. And I think that is because the international community is having effective conversations and agreements to move forward, to have a diversity of instruments and tools for international transfers of personal data. No? And there's a consensus uh, about the need to balance the protection of personal data with greater dynamism in data flows. I heard in, in this event uh, keywords, no? Uh, language is performative, no? And I heard interoperability, convergence, harmonization, trust, transparency, regulation, democracy, stakeholders, ethics as inputs and as outputs of the discussion around data flows. And so if these are the right words, we are in the right path. Of course, I wanted to go into what Argentina is doing about data flows. And uh, in first place, I want to mention that when I took office in March 2022, I made a strong commitment to have a new data protection bill. Why is this? Argentina has um, a law from the year 2000. It was the first country in Latin America to have a data protection law, but we needed to update. And um, this is one of the things that we do. We are also in the process of evaluation of the adequation from the European Commission. We had the adequation in 2003, and now we are going um, again in the adequation. And of course, uh, we, we are working in the um, standard contractor clauses in two senses. First, the Ibero-American um, contractor crosses from the network that Argentina is part, and also we participated in the um, standard clauses from um, the Convention 108 plus. So um, that also are a few steps that we are giving and finally, I want to mention that we are having preliminary conversations regarding CBPR and certifications. Uh, what the law, the new law or the new bill is promoting is adequation, certifications, model contractor clauses, binding corporate mm -hmm. rules, and um, of course, some exceptions. So I think that we're modernized in a special chapter, chapter three of our bill, all the data flow um, strategy. I like that. I, so I like the idea that in fact we have got a toolkit and that hopefully the laws of each of your countries would enable a toolkit of data transfers that actually can be applied for different types of transfers, different companies. But it still is very complicated, you know? And I think my following up question to all of you is being, how do we help those on the ground find what that tool looks like? But before we go there, Alex, you are the last, very patiently. Um, and, and I want to ask you what makes you optimistic, but also I'd like you to share with us, you're a scholar, you're somebody who has worked also in the um, national uh, intelligence here in the US and has been the privacy protector of all of our rights. But as, what are some of the uh, misconceptions or um, 
things that we should know about the world of data flows when it comes to government use of data today as well. Great, thank you very much, and thanks for, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I am very optimistic, especially after hearing all the comments on the panel. Uh, I do think uh, that we are at a very special moment, and I love the, the metaphor of convergence, especially as it applies to the metaphor for the conference. I think of currents coming together, or actually I went on vacation recently and went whitewater rafting, and I don't know if people here have gone whitewater rafting, but as you go in the raft, there will be you know, turbulent waters, and everyone has to work together, together to get through those turbulent waters. And so I, I actually see two separate streams uh, of work that are now converging at last. Um, one of them has to do with commercial privacy, which has really been what this uh, assembly has been focusing on and what data protection officials typically focus on. In the laws, as you know, of many countries around the world, that have comprehensive privacy legislation, as I always tell my students, look for the national security exception. Because there will be a national security exception. There will be other kinds of special provisions for law enforcement access to data. And yet you can't have trusted data flows unless you address the, what happens in that, mm -hmm. uh, it, within mm -hmm. that exception, right? So you have all of the conversations we're having here at this conference uh, and, and other places around the world where you're seeing a convergence of people around commercial privacy issues and looking ahead at things like AI, um, but we're also finally seeing uh, more and more conversations around what happens in the national security side of, this, of the equation. Because again, you can't have true trusted data flows unless you trust that when the data goes to another country, the companies will continue to protect the data in the way that you feel the data should be protected as the originating country but that also that country's government will not seek access to the data in ways that you feel are inconsistent or incompatible with the needs and values of your country. So you have to address both sides of that. And we're getting there. We've had some exciting developments. The EU-US data privacy framework people have mentioned already. The US made, I think, groundbreaking changes in its national security legal framework to address the concerns uh, that the Court of Justice of the European Union had raised. And these, these were, uh, I know that maybe on the outside they don't seem as dramatic. They were dramatic changes in our legal framework, right? So for, for, in our national security legal framework, which is a big deal. Um, and then the OECD Declaration on Trusted Government Access uh, was another groundbreaking moment where we had data protection officials as well as national security law enforcement mm -hmm. officials from OECD member countries come together and say that these are uh, the principles that they all share in common in their own legal frameworks. Um, so I, uh, you asked me, like, what are some common misconceptions? I think one is that, and this is the, uh, you, you mentioned one of the things that we did with CIPL on this, uh, one is that data localization can effectively shield data from legal access by countries, by, by uh, governments in other countries. Because as we all know, the, 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 the current is flowing in the opposite direction. Governments want access to data that is stored in the cloud to data that is stored in, the other, in other countries. And there have been uh, developments in the EU as well as with the Cloud Act in the United States. And of course, a while ago, there was the Cybercrime Convention. The, the momentum in that direction is how do we provide governments the ability to have a trusted framework to access data that's stored mm -hmm. in another country. So I think this idea that you can localize data and shield it from mm -hmm. legal access from other countries is going against the current of where our governments are going around the world. Um, and I guess another broad um, misconception, I think, is that um, governments, when they deal with national security, are, are doing so in an unregulated way. Every country has its own complicated set of laws that restrict how the governments can, can carry out national security activities. I would say every democracy governed by the rule of law has those, uh, those kinds of foundational aspects. They are difficult to understand sometimes. They require expert uh, review and analysis in order to be, to be able to better understand it. Um, so I think, you know, my, my hope is that with people who are on these rafts going through the waters, as you converge, there will be even more turbulence ahead. We're already seeing some of that convergence. And uh, I would hope that the people working on this don't develop fatigue, don't decide, you know, I've been rowing enough, I got other things to do, I'm gonna you know, put the raft down here and go have a picnic or something. I know that's not what people are doing, but there's so many crises and so many calls on our attention. Yes. We have this momentum, the people working these issues are experts on them now, they know each other, let's keep going. <laughs>
Right. And I think we can make progress. And, and that's a great message. I mean, I, I, I have to say it is incredible that the achievement of the OECD, Trusted Government Access Data Principles this Declaration, and that there has been agreement on this. And, and you know, really kudos to everybody who was at that table. We know that there were lots of nation, nation states as well as uh, the European Commission and, and, and also those who, who are in the intelligence community. Alex, you know, how do we get those who are in these different silos to sit at the same table and, and raft together? Because at the moment, they're all rafting in their own rafts. Well, my, my hope is that we will have a, uh, we have the Global Privacy Assembly, we should have the Global Trusted Government Access Assembly. Right. So we should be having a global conversation where representatives from the national security communities and the data protection communities come together. You have to have, you mentioned mutual understanding. I mean, that is so important. Uh, data protection regulators have to understand not only how different every country is in terms of how it regulates national security, but also understand how their own countries do it. And I think there's a tendency among national security officials in all countries to, to make sure, no, 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 this is our area, we know what we're doing, you know, don't, don't look at what we're doing because it's secret or everything uh, along those lines, but we have, to, we have to engage each other, be willing to meet each other where they are, understand uh, what the protections are, in place for national security and privacy. So I, I do think that uh, with Japan's great leadership, the, the Data Free Flow with Trust Initiative is a, great, uh, is a great initiative to continue to push this forward. And the OECD, having had all of this experience developing the Trusted Government Access Principles with uh, all of the member countries, is a, is a great place to also focus on. I'd like to ask, actually, a question as to what concretely can each of you, in your roles, do to advance us in, in this, from this good momentum. Maybe, Dolores, I'd like to start with you, because we've heard about the Cloud Act and negotiations. So we know that US has reached um, a negotiations on the Cloud Act with UK, with Australia. And you know, that, that is possibly an avenue for Europe as well. Uh, this is not about intelligence gathering, but it's about law enforcement, access to data, where companies are again in, the, uh, in this space between hard rock and the hard, what is it? Hard place and the rock. <laughs> rock and hard place. That, you know, you know, you know what I mean. It's the Bermuda, Bermuda Triangle, that kind of thing. <laughs> this is where they all are. This is where they all are. So, you know, can we expect some progress on that? Sorry, I'm also on the triangle of the Bermuda Triangle. What was the question, basically? The question was <laughs> the Cloud Act, on the Cloud Act. And can we have more bilateral <laughs> arrangements so that some of these um, justifiable access to data can take place? Yeah, of course, I mean, uh, it will depend largely on the level of protection that will be on the other side. But do you think after the US-EU framework this is possible now to uh, contemplate? At this moment, at the present moment, how it's currently presented, I think no, but could be something to work on and to improve. Okay. Everybody else, what are one or two or three things that we should be working on? Who wants to kick us off? Okay. Elizabeth, come on. So I think we need mutual recognition of SCCs. Okay. So we talked about 20 different SCCs, and I think what companies are looking for is let's save the paperwork of privacy in designing SCCs, and let's instead use that resource so we have mutual recognition of SCCs, and we can use that resource to really build legitimate, effective, accountable privacy programs. Because I really think it takes us off our game if we are just focused on SCC paperwork, mm -hmm. addendum after addendum after addendum. Um, so I really think let's be practical and let's look at mutual recognition. And you know, just hats off to Japan for I think the first mutual recognition of an adequacy agreement between the EU and Japan. And I just think we need to get to a place where we are willing to mutually recognize these, these tools in the toolkit in a way that looks at outcomes and not necessarily process. So that's one thing. The second thing I would say really quickly is I think we need a real robust discussion about risk. Mm -hmm. And that's something that the Information Accountability Foundation would be happy to host. And this would be a real discussion about how the fact that all transfers are not the same. Okay, so a transfer of, you know, an IP address is not the same as transferring identifiable um, health information from a clinical trial. 
So can we have a real conversation about risk and not consider that all transfers are the same? Those are my two. Uh, Bertrand, can I, can I ask you about this one? Why, why is it that people feel frustra frustrated about this lack of risk-based approach as to how we, uh, how it seems European data protection authorities <coughs> approach data transfers? And transfers are not all the same. I mean, government is not interested in every transfer, are they? But they're interested in particular transfers. Yet, even Google Analytics is subject to the same rules as perhaps communications data or financial services data. Well, I will, uh, I will have uh, several answers. Uh, well, actually, maybe to one question which has been, not been raised. Um, sure. But, um, you know, I mean, the panel this morning on risk was very, uh, very interesting to see how actually it's difficult to assess uh, what risk is. Mm -hmm. So as a regulator, we, we, we approach this uh, you know, risk uh, paradigm very prudently, I would say, uh, given our mandate. Um, one thing I would like to, to, to stress um, in, in, you know, when, you, when you ask what should be done, I think we should, uh, especially as a community of DPAs, uh, maybe lay the stress on enforcement co cooperation. And this is, by the way, uh, another way, uh, another reason to be optimistic. I feel that the mood uh, is, um, is uh, very positive towards um, enforcement cooperation and on a very uh, uh, day-to-day basis, an ad hoc basis, uh, let's say, to connect uh, Ugandan with Bavarian and uh, with the Canadian in the middle and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a need, I think. Uh, uh, I mean, clearly, I mean, most of our bilateral discussions usually are on enforcement. Um, yes, well, another thing is, um, uh, you know, um, DTA, D, 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 um, 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 data transfer impact assessment. Um, that's, I think, a good methodology and uh, to, to develop, maybe to develop, you know, um, jointly with other DPAs. Uh, we will um, publish a methodology for uh, TIA um, in the very, very uh, next days or weeks on our websites for consultation. So when it will be uh, released, uh, really, I, I, I'd be happy to, to have all uh, your comments. Well, I hope very much that for both of your wish list, which one is enforcement cooperation, in order to do that effectively, there has to be, as Liz says, agreement on risk, because different data protection authorities have to decide that there is a risk and harm of, uh, to individuals because of these data transfers. And we've seen that in Ashley Madison mm -hmm. case, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen that in Clearview AI. Those were interesting international cooperation enforcement. But, but, for, but for, we don't see but, the EU cooperating outside of that region. So I'd okay. really like to see that. Okay, as in kind of with other regulators, not in EU region, okay. But, but also, to your point, transfer risk assessment, if we want to see methodology of that, well, then we need to address the risk as well, in that as well, right? We, you know, hopefully that will be in the EDPB guidance or methodology. Well, once again, I feel wait very prudent. Okay, <laughs> we wait to see. Um, Nima. Sure, thanks. Um, I want to go back to your question of what can we do? What we need to do now and just go through a couple of key issues, some of which I think um, other folks of the panel have, have touched upon. Um, the OECD trusted government access principles. I think we need to continue this, this conversation and continue this momentum and progress on the TGA principles. Um, a couple of things that are, I think, really key to that. One is conversations with non-OECD countries. Mm -hmm. um, this is something we, we've talked about and collaborated with, with the UK, but and I know our team has talked to, for example, Argentina, Brazil, other countries around the world um, about these principles. We need to continue talking about them. Um, but importantly, we also need to put meat on the bones. We need to make sure that jurisdictions understand what they would need to do to be in adherence with the principles. And so I think continuing this conversation um, and trying to all, I guess, to use Alex's metaphor, continuing rowing the raft in the same direction is important. Um, the second thing is, um, we've talked about CBPR, but I think this focus on interoperable, multilateral solutions. Yes. Um, this has to be a conversation that's not just focused on a, a couple of, of um, countries or a couple of stakeholders, but really includes input from 
businesses, civil society, enforcers, policymakers. Um, and that's, I think, how we're going to get to this interoperable solution. So I think the CBPR form is, is, was built with that idea. Um, and, and we hope and invite others and would happily talk to any of you about um, the work on the forum um, following this. Um, privacy, um, privacy enhancing technology and other solutions. Um, I think that technology continues to develop and we should think about a way in ways that encryption and other technological solutions can help us overcome some of the barriers that we're facing in the data flow space. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, just to maybe revisit a point I raised earlier, is I think we have to meet small and medium-sized businesses where they are. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to have these very technical conversations. It's another thing to translate that so that people can actually use the guidance and understand mechanisms, and also so that we have feedback mechanisms so we know what's working and what's not working. And I think that that's something we all need to get better at is making sure that what we're doing is comprehensible right. to the mm -hmm. folks that matter most. Uh, let me ask you a follow-up question because you are uh, championing and U.S. has been championing and doing lots of work on both OECD principles and the CBPR. Uh, I mean, sometimes we hear criticism the CBPR have been uh, there for some time and they need to be upgraded and updated to simply reflect the development in law and policy in the last few years. Um, is that possible? Is that something that could be, will be planned? And would, it, would we be able to imagine a world where we would link OECD trusted government access to data principles into the CBPR and with CBPR, and then we would be able to answer the question, what happens that Alex says to data when it goes to these countries? Sure, I mean, I think to take the, the first question is, you know, once we launched the, the CBPR form in April, there's work to sort of stand it up. Um, you know, we've committed to looking at the program requirements. I think everybody who's been a part of that process understands that the CBPR was launched in 2011 in APEC. The world is different. Um, and that there is work that can be done on a consensus basis um, to try to address um, to the extent that there are gaps or areas where, where updates are needed. So to answer your question, I guess, much more quickly, yes. Good. <laughs> there's, there's work. Hmm. And I invite all of you, um, I invite folks to participate in that conversation, become an associate, become a member. Um, your second question, I think, about government access is a really important one. It's one that um, has come up in the data free flows with trust. Um, conversation. What is what is trust? And I think, you know, we've this this idea of government access has been something that's come up in the workshops we've had at the CBPR forum, um, where you know different stakeholders have discussed the TGA principles. They've discussed um, the increasing importance of addressing this issue. Um, and I think it's possible that um, you know the the forum could be a, a place um, where some of those issues can converge. What that looks like, I think we have to see. Obviously. Um, the forum operates on a multilateral basis. It operates on a consensus basis. It operates based off of input from stakeholders. And so I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done to understand how those issues would, would and, come together. And I now want to ask the commission, what, what do you think needs to be done? But can you, can you also see the world where, where we could make build bridges between certifications under GDPR and those in um, CBPR upgraded 2.0? Thank you. <clears throat> you know I would have asked you that question. Yeah, well, I know. Bruno, if he was here, <laughs> <Don't> so. <worry. laughs> so basically, first of all, certification schemes is also an element present in the GDPR. So it's not foreign or an external element. And actually, the European Union is currently developing a certification scheme. Second, I think that to be credible, a certification scheme and to be really trust uh, trustworthy for uh, not only regulators and businesses, but also for citizens. Um, it should be uh, it should be ensuring a certain level of protection. This should be based on, uh, on a right-based environment, um, but also taking into consideration the different uh, level of protection already um, established in current laws which I think is not the case of the CVPR at the moment. Uh, because not only in Europe, in all, also in Latin American countries, um, the level of protection established in, uh, not only in Europe and in Latin America, also in, in Africa and in Asia, the level of protection that the CVPR offers does not meet the requirements 
of the level of protection that is established in our current systems. So um, this is quite important because when we are discussing the certification scheme, we cannot um, undermine the level of protection already given to our citizens. And um, also, just to conclude, I think that uh, moving forward with um, commenting on, on your thoughts, on your reflections, if the global CVPR certification or the initiative of global CVPR would think of uh, upgrade and update their certification scheme, perhaps it would be possible to talk about uh, convergence also in certification schemes. Mm -hmm. But as it is now, I don't think sure. that's, that's possible. Well, I, I, I hear positives and optimism there. So it's just about upgrading. Um, any other <laughs> comments, Immaculate, please? Just to say that um, often when we have conversation with uh, CBPR, GDPR, mm -hmm. uh, what we are keen on is to see the African voice in this conversation. Good. So that uh, we, our, our different data protection authorities uh, coming into fold, having conversation, what are the commonalities, their efforts within the African continent through Smart Africa, the Network for African Data Protection Authority, the African Union, to also that we are not just recipients, we are also participating in a, mm -hmm. a framework that actually then defines who we are as an African continent and how we want us to make decisions in terms of moving forward. After all, in terms we have the youngest growing population and a lot of potential in terms of this space of digital. And therefore, our voice in this conversation also needs to be given primary focus. And we would love to have your voice. And I do hope that you will be participating also at this CBPR forum, um, uh, representing that voice. Any other comments on this question as to what concretely uh, we can do, Beatrice or Commissioner Alex? I, uh, so I never thought I would do this, but I'm going to read from the OECD declaration one of the preambular statements, which I never read before in my life, but now it's a very important one. It says, we recognize that where our legal frameworks require that transport or data flows are subject to safeguards, our countries take into account a destination country's effective implementation of the principles as a positive contribution towards facilitating, facilitating transport or data flows. So for me, the, the next step is to how do we take these principles and make sure that they deliver that positive contribution? How do, you know, Nima talked about how do we put meat on the bones? How do we make that real? And I think as an initial step, it is to uh, map out what are, how do countries uh, protect uh, privacy in, as they access government data, I mean, the government accesses data in accordance with these principles. And then again, enhancing mutual understanding, making sure that people understand how their own country does this and then how other countries do it right. so that we can have a more um, focused and effective conversation on these issues. And that would help also companies who have to do these transfer risk uh, impact assessments exactly. as well as data protection authorities. I understand the UK government is already working on its own mapping. I hope we'll see, well, we've seen quite a lot from US government in the context of the US uh, EU framework. Um, I want to make sure that there are comments or questions. Do, having heard what you've heard, what do you think we should be working on or we should do? Do you have an answer to the question I've asked the panelists? Anybody, please take the, take the mic um, from the audience. Quickly, be quick, and you have to run straight to the front. <laughs> yes, please, gentlemen at the end, please run to the front. I don't know which mic microphones work. Quick, snappy questions <laughs> and comments, please. Thank you. We have got one, two minutes. I think that's the one that works. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the Cloud Act has been mentioned, and it's an uh, important framework for cross-border data flow and cross-border data access. I have a question about the Cloud Act, if any of you can uh, address. So the Cloud as, as Act has been described as a model for international cooperation, but I will you know, challenge that characterization because the Cloud Act was first designed for countries who, have, who share similar, similar values with the United States, and it classifies the world into qualified governments and non-qualified governments. And it has been more than six years since it was adopted, and now we have only two countries that are qualified. So my question is, one, it is not scalable. It cannot be scalable to the 190-something countries. 
And if you think of uh, the global south and small countries, let's say Africa, they have no choice. That one, most of the, their data is stored and held by US companies, and the cross-border data flow mechanisms do not work. They have no mutual legal assistance uh, system. The Cloud Act doesn't work. Companies do not reply to Africa countries in the, the voluntary scheme. And this reinforces the desire to localize data. Yeah. So my question is, do you envision any kind of framework outside the Cloud Act that could benefit all countries? Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, I'll just jump in and say, um, those are very important challenges. Those are very important issues. I know that people uh, working on Cloud Act agreements understand that those are the challenges and those are the issues. I'm not aware of a magic bullet answer other than to commit to this path forward to find ways to come up, come up with a framework that is rights protective, um, practicable, and scalable. Um, so I, it, it is part of the conversation that has to happen going forward. How do we do that? How do we make what happens with Cloud Act agreements, what's going to happen you know, with the e-evidence directive, et cetera, how do we make that scalable? But we have to remember that ultimately it also has to be rights protective. Yeah, well, if we look for uh, an instrument to make uh, you know, um, our different jurisdictions uh, converge, I would prefer Convention 108 plus uh, to the Cloud Act. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but, but not all EU countries have even ratified the, the Convention 108, dare I say, but yeah, okay. No, yeah, it's a possibility. I mean, yeah. Beatrice push, you know. and Dolores. Uh, sorry, no, just, just uh, comment, you know, uh, supporting. I think that we do not have, perhaps, to have new solutions, but work with the existing ones. And the Convention 108 and Convention 108 Plus um, have, are, are, are the instrument which is binding for everybody Obviously, uh, it, was, it, it has not been ratified by all countries, but it is undeniably that uh, given like in the, in the next, uh, up, 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 well, <laughs> it's undeniably that um, uh, through the years, uh, its nature has turned to a more universal one and more countries around the world are ratifying. I have Beatrice next to me, who Argentina has ratified Convention 108 plus uh, recently, and we have lots of examples, not only from Europe, but from Asia, from, Afri uh, from Africa, mm -hmm. um, that has ratified Convention 108 Plus. So I think that that's the instrument is already, it already exists, it's there. Right, another thing yes. to talk um, Just to make a comment, uh, yes, we, we ratified this year Convention 108 Plus, um, but Argentina started targeting a diverse set of instruments and tools. And that means to engage in dialogue with various stakeholders, national and international level, uh, in order to establish clear rules and promote trust and transparency. But another key factor is to enhance cooperation among different regulatory authorities to maximize the exchange of experience and knowledge. And uh, I think that the dialogue in the GPA is fundamental for that. Furthermore, also companies are a, play a, um, a central role by implementing safeguards and using tools to ensure the protection of personal data. But I want to make a special comment because I think that also building state capacity, if we're talking about democracy and how we can strengthen democracies, we're looking forward to produce regulations and provide enforcement. And yesterday, there was a very pretty good discussion about the roles of policymaking and the roles of enforcement, and the need to switch roles sometimes. And I would like to say that it is important that the DPAs can cope with different rationalities and strategies. Political strategic view, technical analysis, dialogue with stakeholders, understanding the business model. We need a state that, that, that can cope with different functions and the regulatory and enforcement capacities are crucial for economic development and innovation. I'm obviously talking from the point of view of a Latin American state, but to go forward in data flows, I think that we need to think with a contextual or a situational autonomy. So that was a message I would like to share. 
Thank you, Beatrice. These are really positive words on which we are going to end this panel because you are saying there is no, this is not a beauty context. I've heard that before. We need multiplicity of um, mechanisms and approaches um, and things that actually fit different uh, legal systems and different sizes and types of companies. I have heard the wish list, uh, which Liz started, but you all added to, which amounts to uh, short term solutions mapping, mutualizing uh, standard contractual clauses. Perhaps BCR, nobody mentioned that, but that's my favorite. Let's <laughs> mutualize that as well. Let's evolve work, Jürgen Reit. Those of us who've been pioneering this for so many years, we want to see this become something more than just a piece of paper, but actually accountability mechanism. We've heard about the importance of privacy enhancing technologies um, and, safe, and safeguards and security measures um, as well. We've heard about global CBPR potential. I'm super excited about that and we have to work together and upgrade and build those bridges with those who, who are not in the system but are, but are interested as well. We have to make sure that we've got the voice of everybody there and Africa and Latin America and Asia because that's frankly where the world is moving to. I'm sorry, we are a little bit too old and too old fashioned sometimes. Um, it's not just the US companies, no European. The world is moving east and, and south as well. And I've heard that we have to strive to perhaps multilateral, um, you know, one stop shop mechanism that actually would solve this. Uh, Liz, you call this Breton Woods for Data. I talk about New Deal for data, and maybe that's what we need, so that everybody has got a just access and just ability to use data. Um, so with that, uh, please, um, those of you fellow rafters, um, fellow travelers um, on the way over the ripples, waves, and currents, we have got data flow currents moving very fast, and we have to move with them, and we have to make sure we um, influence those currents as well. And those who, who are organizing the next privacy GPA, um, we know who you are. Please, can we have um, a panel on um, this topic together with the government and law enforcement regulators and community as well? And I'm happy to moderate that.